This video was not commissioned by the Moriel Board or Jacob Prash, but was a private undertaking. While it is common knowledge that I work in tandem with Moriel, I was not asked by anyone to produce this. This was produced for Moriel's benefit should they decide to use it, but not at Moriel's direction. Nobody in Moriel, including Jacob Prash, were aware of its production until its completion. Since the dismissal of David Nathan from Moriel Ministries in the fall of 2018, an incessant barrage of slanderous and false accusations have followed Jacob Prash and Moriel Ministries. Some have seemingly made it their personal mission to attack and undermine Moriel Ministries by any means necessary, leveling accusations ranging from financial impropriety to alcoholism to womanizing. Not even one of these accusations can be substantiated with any merit whatsoever, but are purely the result of retaliation, which is satanically motivated hate, and that is not said for dramatic effect. I have written an entire article covering many of the players involved in this sad and tired saga. This article can be found at beginningofsorrows.org. In March of 2019, a man calling himself Frank Rogers began a YouTube channel devoted entirely to anti-Jacob Prash propaganda. You can currently find six videos devoted entirely to slandering Jacob Prash. This man is a defender of David Nathan's heretical teachings and was therefore angered when the Moriel board unanimously decided to remove David Nathan. The critiques of Mr. Rogers range from the petty to the outright ridiculous. He has critiqued Jacob's pronunciation of ancient Greek words and even made an entire video lamenting Jacob's use of the word stupid to describe a woman who literally wants to kill breathing babies. The great hypocrisy of Mr. Rogers' video is, of course, the title itself which is called Stupid Is As Stupid Does. Mr. Rogers has no problem insinuating that Jacob Prash himself is stupid, but doesn't like it when it is applied to a promoter of infanticide. When you see petty critiques of this nature, you can be sure vendetta is the only motivation, which is satanically inspired. Mr. Rogers' hypocrisy is only eclipsed by his astounding laziness or outright deception, as you will soon see. In his latest installment, Mr. Rogers questions Jacob's background and ethnicity, insinuating that he's just not Jewish enough, and comparing him with the Jewishness of David Nathan. This is not merely a petty thing for someone to do, but it is frankly weird. The very clear and distinct impression given here is that because both David Nathan's parents are Jewish, that makes him more credible than someone who only has one Jewish parent. Allow me to remind you that Judas Iscariot was wholly Jewish. The entire thrust of Mr. Rogers' video, however, is that Jacob Prash and Moriel were completely unjustified in their dismissal of David Nathan because, as it appears in his video, Jacob and Moriel have agreed with David Nathan's doctrinal position this entire time. Mr. Rogers goes to great lengths to show Jacob nodding in agreement as David Nathan expounds his views on the millennial reign of Christ and the end of the Age of Grace. Let's hear a clip from Mr. Rogers' video. I think it's very important. What Jacob's saying is it's so important. It just needs to be just re-emphasized. Is after the rapture, the age and dispensation of grace as we know it, the church age is over. From that moment until the end of the millennium, everything reverts back under law. There is no salvation in the sense of being adopted, being part of the family of God. And so when Jesus comes, that's it. Salvation, as we understand it, by grace is over. After that, everything goes back under law. Yeah. We see Jacob nodding his head in agreement at everything David is saying. Jacob and Marco agree 100% that once the door is shut, after Christ's return, salvation as we know it is over. 
This means that millennial Jews and Gentiles will not be saved under grace as the marriage feast is over and Noah's Ark has been shut. Now, to the naive and undiscerning eye, what Mr. Rogers just did right there might have seemed somewhat compelling. The very clear implication given is that Jacob Prash agreed with David Nathan on his teaching regarding the millennium in 2016. So therefore, his dispute with David Nathan's teaching in the fall of 2018 is erroneous, making Jacob Prash a double-minded man. Unfortunately for Mr. Rogers, and even more unfortunately for anyone who happened to watch this video, what you just witnessed was verbal and logical con artistry. This tactic of deception was a combination of what's known in logic as equivocation and also bait and switch. The combination of these two fallacious forms of reasoning and phony argumentation are what's known as the Mott and Bailey fallacy. The statements from David Nathan presented here are not the statements Moriel ever contended with. In fact, I find it thoroughly curious that Mr. Rogers presents himself as one informed and someone who has learned from Jacob and has apparently followed this entire saga along with many of his cohorts, leading us to believe that he must indeed be familiar with Jacob Prash's first public statement regarding this issue over seven months ago. But if this is the case, then how did Mr. Rogers miss Jacob Prash's very clear statements on this specific subject? Mr. Rogers is either being deliberately deceptive, or he is in fact the lazy researcher he has accused others of being. Here is a clip of Jacob Prash in his very first public statement regarding David Nathan in September of 2018. The idea that it's a Gentile invention, that the blood of Jesus is everlasting, because grace comes to an end. Now, I have always taught, I've always taught that the time of the Gentiles comes to an end, and that the era of grace comes to an end. That I have always taught, and with that I agree with David. The times of the Gentiles comes to an end, the age of the church per se comes to an end, and the era of grace comes to an end, it is clear in the book of Revelation that the Lord God reverts to an Old Testament motif, dealing judgmentally with the nations, turning his focus back on the salvation of Israel, and so forth. We've always taught these things. But to equate that with the efficaciousness of the blood of Jesus, saying that his blood is not everlasting as an atonement for sin, this is pure heresy. The angel in Revelation preaches an everlasting gospel. So, what Mr. Rogers so conveniently and deceptively left out of his narrative is that Jacob Prash has always agreed with David Nathan about exactly what he stated in the video that Mr. Rogers showed. What was absent and conspicuously so from Mr. Rogers' video, is the very thing that Maury L. took issue with, namely, David Nathan's statements about the blood of Jesus. These statements were not made in those video clips at that particular time. And so the argument is an erroneous one. David Nathan said nothing that Jacob disagreed with, but, when a similar topic was raised, and David Nathan made assertions about the blood of Jesus, that's when the problem began. Please listen to David. There will come a time where the grace of God comes to an end. For the Gentile mind, this is difficult to conceive. Because you, were, you have been grown, you've been brought up in a church culture that says that the blood of Jesus Christ is eternal to save mankind for eternity. It's not a biblical concept. It's a Gentile concept. It's not biblical. The blood of Christ will save until the end of the dispensation of grace. When the age of grace comes to an end, the blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything.
The blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything. Well, this is very important and it needs to be kept on the, uh, the recording. There are some people who teach that these sacrifices are memorials that you look back to the cross. Nothing can be further from the truth. I respectfully disagree with that mindset or that form of understanding or theology. They don't look back to the cross. They are then atoned by the blood of animals that they may partake in the religious observances. Well, you've heard David's words. And David says that the idea of the blood of Jesus being efficacious in an everlasting way is an invention of the Gentile church. It is because people are not Jewish that they cannot understand it. He goes on to say that nothing can be further from the truth than the belief or the interpretation of Ezekiel and so forth, these would be the passages, that the millennial sacrifices look back to the cross and they're a way, of course, to teach the gospel during the millennium. As you can see, Jacob has always been in agreement with David Nathan that the age of grace as we know it comes to an end. But to make the jump that the blood of Jesus therefore ceases to cleanse people from their sins is a wild heresy and in fact another gospel. To even insinuate that anyone at any time could be saved by anything other than the blood of Jesus is to present another gospel and undermine the entire Bible. Let us be extremely clear. Neither Moses, nor Abraham, nor Caleb, nor Joshua, nor Peter, nor John the Baptist, nor anyone today has been saved or ever will be saved by anything other than the blood of Christ. Though all in different contexts, some in the Old Covenant, some in the New, it was only ever the blood of Christ that could cleanse them from their sins. And so it is during the millennium. David Nathan makes a massive and heretical leap from stating that the age of grace comes to an end and then equating that with the blood of Christ coming to an end. Jacob was not aware that David Nathan had been teaching dogmatically in other places this very thing. Mr. Rogers sends out a warning shot, so to speak, that he is going to show Jacob Prash at a conference with David Nathan and Bill Randalls in agreement with David Nathan when he does mention the blood of Christ and seems somewhat ambiguous about its efficacious or saving nature during the millennium. A year and a half later, David Nathan would once again share his millennial view and Jacob would once again not protest at all. <laughs> So why didn't Mr. Rogers show the clip to which he alludes? I suspect it's because if he had shown it, it would undermine his false and deceptive narrative. Let's take a look. So the question is, and this is a, a question that I'm not going to try to answer, but the question is, what happens to those who are faithful to the Lord during the millennial reign? We know that their sins have been atoned for, hence the animal sacrifices. Here begins the confusing statements of David Nathan. He says that he knows their sins are atoned for, hence the animal sacrifices. He, however, does not say, as he did in previous clips, that there will come a time when the blood of Jesus will not profit anyone anything. So you can see the ambiguity in his remarks. So, if the blood of Christ cleanses those in the millennium, then as he cleanses us now, then surely they will be part, part of the bride. But they're not. <clears throat> Wait, though. Is there, um, I, I'd like to say something that I don't want to increase confusion, okay? But it's inconceivable for me to believe that anyone could be reconciled to God on any level other than by the blood of Jesus. Absolutely. I want that to be very clear. Yeah, I agree. 
The statement made by David Nathan at the conference with Bill Randalls and Jacob Prash was decidedly more ambiguous than the clips you just saw, but even still, you will see Jacob about to respond to what he has just said, but before he can speak, Bill Randalls interrupts him, quite concerned. David Nathan then capitulates and says he agrees with Bill. But we know from his other dogmatic teachings that he couldn't possibly agree with Bill. David Nathan is a double-minded deceiver. The blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything. Upon his agreement with Bill, Jacob gives him the benefit of the doubt and presumably assumes that he must have misspoke. So where did Frank Rogers learn his sneaky tactics? One could reasonably assume he might have learned them from David Nathan himself, who is skilled in the art of equivocation and bait and switch. Let's take a look. Okay, so we move to the other charge made, that of you are a heretic because you believe that the blood of Christ does not avail forever. Well, I... That is the charge, but that's certainly not something I believe. If I can read a portion of uh, Jacob's email to me. Well, sorry, let me rephrase that. It wasn't an email to me. It was an email to a supporter of Moriel who had obviously found issue with my teaching. And Jacob says this, The best I could gauge the situation personally was that he partially misrepresented his own actual beliefs in the manner he addressed an important theological issue and was to some degree misunderstood. David Nathan does subscribe to the moral statement of faith that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Dated the 22nd of July. Notice that David Nathan's initial defense of himself is to exploit the graciousness of Jacob Prash in not jumping to conclusions. When a concerned Moriel listener wrote to Moriel expressing those concerns, Jacob's initial response was to give David Nathan the benefit of the doubt rather than hastily jumping to conclusions. Stuart Menelaus, David Nathan, and others such as Frank Rogers have tried to show that Jacob Prash has dealt unjustly and harshly with David Nathan, but they bafflingly seek to do this by showing a very clear example of just how gracious Jacob Prash was concerning David Nathan. He did not jump to conclusions, but attempted to give him the benefit of the doubt as grace would dictate. In a video clip presented by the complainant, it appears to be shown that you state that the blood of Christ does not avail for uh, avail forever. Well, yes, in that heavily, heavily edited video clip, which actually needs to be seen in full to understand the context in which I said that it does appear that I'm saying that, but that's certainly in its context, not what I taught. Well, it, we've got a small clip. Uh, um, I, I'd like to say something that I don't want to increase confusion, okay? But it's inconceivable for me to believe that anyone could be reconciled to God on any level other than by the blood of Jesus. Absolutely. I want that to be very clear. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so w we can hear you make a, a public statement regarding what you believe about the blood of Christ. That is correct. In fact, twice. I agree that the blood of Christ is efficacious or eternal. Stuart Menelaus makes reference to the video clip which we have already shown and uses dismissive language to undermine the credibility of that video, saying, it appears that you teach the blood of Jesus will not avail for eternity. Then, in classic bait and switch form, they present as evidence of his vindication an entirely different clip from the one they had just alluded to. This would be as if someone were being accused of committing a crime on a particular Monday, and as evidence of their vindication, they said it was impossible because of what they were doing on Friday. This is Con Artistry 101. On top of all this, the baffling hypocrisy, of course, is the notion that Stuart Menelaus and David Nathan would insinuate that the clip shown by Moriel Ministries was heavily edited, which it was not, while they go on to show a completely unrelated clip that was in fact heavily edited. 
they deliberately cut out David Nathan's initial remarks that led to Bill Randall's response of concern. We do see David Nathan capitulate and say, yes, I agree, but this is reluctantly and completely at odds with his other statement. You have been grown, you've been brought up in a church culture that says that the blood of Jesus Christ is eternal to save mankind for eternity. It's not a biblical concept. It's a Gentile concept. It's not biblical. The blood of Christ will save until the end of the dispensation of grace. When the age of grace comes to an end, the blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything. Either confused about his own tangled web of lies or unconcerned that anybody might catch on, David Nathan then goes on to state unequivocally that he has never taught that the blood of Christ would not avail for eternity. This is an out and out lie. Can, can we just make clear to the, those who are watching? I categorically state and believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is eternal. I have never taught that the blood of Jesus Christ does not save for eternity. You've been brought up in a church culture that says that the blood of Jesus Christ is eternal to save mankind for eternity. It's not a biblical concept. I have never taught that the blood of Jesus Christ does not save for eternity. When the age of grace comes to an end, the blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything. We can see then the deceptive nature of both Stuart Menelaus and David Nathan. Both of them know full well what clip was being referenced and both of them denied that there was any merit to it. David Nathan lied on camera and was aided and abetted in that lie and false witness by Stuart Menelaus. You can see the equivocation here hard at work with the mishandling of the word eternal. What David Nathan means is that he believes those who are already saved will be saved for eternity, but he still maintains that those in the millennium will be saved by something other than the blood of Christ. David Nathan is trying to have his cake and eat it too, by using two different contexts for the word eternal or eternity. David Nathan believes that the blood of Christ is eternal for those who already have it, but he does not believe that it will be eternally available. Herein lies his deception. He still believes in some other gospel during the time of the millennium, and shockingly, in the very same interview, seems to present that very notion. The issue, of course, is the millennium. When the age of grace comes to an end, we enter into a new age, of which the Bible is not 100% clear. Just to clarify this, uh, we can understand that the millennium is a new era. No one knows the details of everything that will take place. In other words, how it will actually all work out. So to argue about it would be indeed foolishness. Unfortunately, the only foolishness is the foolishness being displayed by Stuart Menelaus and David Nathan and their attempt to dismiss his dogmatic assertion that the time will come when the blood of Jesus will not profit anyone anything. Yes, it is indeed foolishness to make such assertions which are a fundamental denial and undermining of the gospel itself. Anyone who does not comprehend the very nature of the gospel is not fit for ministry in any sense. The natural question then becomes, how exactly does David Nathan believe Old Testament saints were saved? They did not live in the age of grace. By his casting doubt on people being saved by the blood of Christ outside the age of grace during the millennium, he simultaneously and unwittingly cast doubt as to how every Old Testament saint was saved. This is a monumental problem.
If people in the millennium cannot be saved by the blood of Christ because the age of grace is over, then by David Nathan's own fallacious and unbiblical logic, every Old Testament saint was saved by something other than the blood of Christ, because the age of grace had not yet begun. Stuart Menelaus and David Nathan then continue their march of deception by attempting to justify and defend David Nathan's very clear and prescriptive word of faith teaching that believers can pray into clothing and anoint it with God's healing power. The way they justify and defend this teaching is to deny that it ever existed in the first place. Okay, so our last point, praying for pieces of material, in this case a tie and also mention of a jacket and that bringing healing to individuals. Now, uh, this has been taken from a, a video that was possibly 11 years ago. What is this that you are teaching, David, uh, on this video? Because the scriptures do not tell us to um, anoint materials and your remarks regarding your jacket being anointed to heal it's it's concerning for me as i'm sure uh, it has concerned others and i refer to this recent video that has been uploaded to youtube it, it has obviously been edited and other pieces of footage have been put into this uh, remember i'm a professional editor uh, well, we noticed that Stewart was a professional editor from the way he dramatically edited the footage of David Nathan's remarks at the conference with Jacob Prash and Bill Randalls, while neglecting to show the very footage in question. Professional in his ability and quite unprofessional in his conduct. Um, but let us be clear here, we need an explanation. Is this a precedent? You teach? Not at all. Yeah. Stuart, as, as you said, that was a teaching from 11 years ago. What I was doing, I was trying to teach a not prescriptive, uh, but a descriptive example of an unusual miracle citing uh, two of my own personal experiences. Two occasions where I strongly uh, felt led of the Spirit to, by way of a prescriptive, sorry, by way of a descriptive example to believers, uh, once with a jacket and once with a tie in a house group uh, meeting. Uh, this was never taught prescriptively. It was done as an example. There are only two options here. Either David Nathan does not know the meaning of the word prescriptive or he is lying on purpose. I'm inclined to believe the latter, as David Nathan is not an ignorant man. He's quite capable, and therefore the nature of what he's doing becomes all the more egregious. A descriptive teaching is one where you simply tell what has happened. A prescriptive teaching is one where you tell what should happen. This is foundational both to biblical study and to general grammar. David Nathan maintains ardently that he never taught as prescriptive that people could do what he says they can do. But as you'll see, this is a complete lie. Now, let's take a look at the footage that Stuart Menelaus so deceptively insinuates was heavily edited. Why is it that the church has no power? Although we've been given authority, there's no reality in its exercising. Well, that doesn't sound like English. Or the exercising thereof. The reason is, saints, we have to establish authority. It's no good being given authority. That authority needs to be established. It needs to be exercised. It needs to be enforced. Acts chapter 19 and we'll read from verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Unusual miracles. God is into the unusual, saints. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. So Paul would be given pieces of cloth or aprons to pray over. And he would pray over these cloths. Now we know that this 
is the doctrine of the laying on of hands for those of you who have gone through the basic foundations course, which is really important. And the anointing that was on Paul's life was passed into these handkerchiefs. Remember the, the preceding verse says, God worked unusual miracles. Do you know that you can pray into a piece of cloth? And the very anointing of God remains and abides in that material. Do you know that? I've, I was teaching this once at a home group in Durban. And I happened to have a tie in my pocket and I pulled it out and I prayed over it and I said, does anybody need healing? And this woman said, well, I'll take it. All right, so um, I gave it to her and about 10 minutes later she stopped the meeting. She said, I had a migraine when I came into this place. But as I held on to this tie and thanked God for my healing, she said immediately the migraine left. You see, unusual miracles are fine. They are part of what God does. In another church I was at, I was teaching on the woman who came up to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. So I slung my jacket on my back and I said, does anybody need to be touched by God? And this woman came forward she says, I do. I said, great. I said, anytime you want to just touch the, my, my jacket that was over my shoulder. And I turned my back on her the next minute and I heard thud. And this woman spent half an hour slain in the spirit under the power of God. Now, that's unusual, isn't it? Now, I know as Pentecostals, we don't like that charismatic kind of stuff. But unusual miracles is what God does. David Nathan issues a bald-faced lie by saying that he never taught this as prescriptive. He uses words like have to and need to and says that God is into it. He then specifically implores people by saying, Did you know that you can pray into pieces of cloth? Did you know that? This is a prescriptive teaching. He adds to it two descriptions, but those descriptions in no way negate the very clear prescription that preceded them. Do you know that you can pray into a piece of cloth and the very anointing of God remains and abides in that material? Do you know that? And in fact, if anybody of the, 20, of the last 20 years can name one occasion that I've prayed over a jacket or prayed over a material, please go ahead and show me because it simply doesn't exist. And I happened to have a tie in my pocket and I pulled it out and I prayed over it and I said, does anybody need healing? And this woman said, well, I'll take it. In another church I was at, I was teaching on the woman who came up to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. So I slung my jacket on my back and I said, does anybody need to be touched by God? And this woman came forward she says, I do. I said, great. I said, anytime you want to just touch the, my, my jacket that was over my shoulder. And I turned my back on her the next minute and I heard it thud. And this woman spent half an hour slain in the spirit under the power of God. Now that's unusual, isn't it? If one really were a true Christian, it would be unusual for them to lie so casually, so easily, so readily. David Nathan claims that if anyone can show him even one example of him teaching this in the last 25 years, he'd love to see it because they simply don't exist. Are we witnessing an extreme case of amnesia? I doubt it. What you are looking at is a deceptive man. Okay. Well, once again, I personally have never seen you involved in such actions, and I've never heard you teach such things. Um, what is this that you are teaching, David, uh, on this video? Because the scriptures do not tell us to um, anoint materials and your remarks regarding your jacket being anointed to heal, it's, it's concerning for me, as I'm sure uh, it has concerned others. Stuart Menelaus claims he has never heard David Nathan teach such things. And in the very same interview, bafflingly, Stuart not only admits to hearing David Nathan teach this, but says that it was concerning to him. At this point, I simply can't tell who is leading this train of lies. And we humble ourselves and put this thing behind us. This is not the way we should be behaving. This brings no glory to the Lord. David, thank you 
I know that's not been easy for you and it's been very difficult for you. Thank you for coming. As you can see, not only was Moriel justified in its dismissal of David Nathan, but it would have been a profound act of negligence for them to allow him to stay affiliated with them any longer. So much of this entire saga makes little to no sense. Deborah and Stuart Menelaus rushed to David Nathan's defense and have even championed the nonsense slander videos being produced by Frank Rogers and others in defense of David Nathan. Yet these same two have removed all or most of David Nathan's teachings from their own website and channel. If David Nathan is innocent of the charges, then it is certainly curious that the same people who defended him have simultaneously removed so many of his teachings from their own website. This alone is a window into the massive seat of hypocrisy they are all occupying. Moriel has no desire for this to continue, and Jacob Prash has personally reached out to Stuart and Deborah Menelaus asking for them to please cease commenting, and Moriel would do the same. As the false and slanderous accusations have not merely continued, but accelerated at an exponential rate, it has been deemed prudent to alleviate any potential confusion being brought to well-meaning people seeing this unfortunate spectacle unfold. I am personally urging Frank Rogers and anyone associated with this coalition to cease commenting immediately. This has gone on quite long enough. David Nathan teaches heresy and it is undeniable. But to add insult to injury, he lies through his teeth about things that have been documented. Anyone who continues to defend him or his actions or who continues to defend those who defend him is exercising the same delinquent folly. Moriel has not desired to comment any further about this situation. What was said about David Nathan needed to be said. The body needed to be warned about his dangerous teachings. His dismissal was warranted and necessary and urgent. And when a response was made in his defense, classing these accusations as cancerous and portraying Moriel and Jacob Prash as some sort of bullies on a rampage, a response was necessary. But every time Moriel has issued a statement, it has been in response to false and slanderous accusations. I pray this will be the last response necessary. I hope everybody will find something better to do with their time than seeking to undermine or tarnish the name of one particular person. Frankly, I've never seen anything quite like this in my entire life. Most everybody who has seen this situation unfold over the last eight months is simply tired of hearing about it. It's mind-blowing to me that it is still necessary to respond to some of these outlandish accusations that simply will not cease from this group of people. I pray that everybody finds something better to do with their time, though I do not reasonably expect it to stop. My sad prediction is that you will see a never-ending barrage of anti-Jacob Prash and anti-Moriel propaganda at the hands of many of the people mentioned in this very video. When you see them continue to attack Jacob Prash and Moriel unprovoked, know that you are dealing with the spirit of retaliation and vendetta. God help them all. Again, Nobody at Moriel, including Jacob Prash, asked me to do this. This was not a Moriel commissioned project, but was something I felt was of urgent need to dispel these baseless rumors. <laughs>